sneak in version 1.4 Archivematica webinar. It's the same content that we gave in a live webinar last week. If you are not familiar with Archivematica, if you're a new user, if you've never used it before, you might get more out of starting with one of our introductory webinars, which you'll also find on our YouTube channel. So Archivematica is developed by Artifactual Systems. We are the lead developers of Archivematica, Access to Memory, or more commonly referred to as Atom, and most recently Binder, which is a new um, digital preservation management platform that we built with the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And here at Artifactual, we are archivists, librarians, and technologists, and we work closely with the archival library communities to uh, make our software uh, work for your workflows. And uh, we work closely with a number of clients to help develop new features in our software all the time. So that's what this webinar will be about, is the, the new features that have been uh, sponsored for inclusion in Archivematica version 1.4. So a very brief introduction to Archivematica for those who are maybe new to the software. It is free and open source. Um, we make Archivematica and its code freely available, as well as its documentation and our user forum. It is a digital preservation application based on a series of microservices. Archivematica bundles together many other open source tools for performing digital preservation actions on your digital content that you need to preserve. And it has this sort of basic um, focus on creating AIPs, um, or uh, archival information packages, as well as DIPs, or dissemination information packages, which leads me to my next point, which is that Archivematica is OAIS compliant, or Open Archival Information System. No single piece of software is going to bring you into full OAIS compliance, but Archivematica checks a number of boxes in addition to the policies, procedures, and other systems that you're using um, at your institution. Archivematica integrates, or as we like to call it, shakes hands with other systems for storage and access. Archivematica is not in and of itself a storage system. It can talk to a number of different storage systems, such as JuraCloud, Archivum, uh, a Mounted Network uh, Server. There's a lot of different ways that you can store material that you've processed through Archivematica. And you can also use a number of different access systems. Um, we integrate most closely with Atom because we are the developer of that software as well. Um, but I'm going to talk today about um, a couple of other ways that, that you can use your dissemination information packages with other tools. Um, and Archivematica, um, as I have already mentioned, integrates with many um, open source tools. Um, and that includes systems external to Archivematica, um, such as one for um, for storage or for access, as well as all of the wonderful tools that we bundle into Archivematica that you use when you download and, and use the tool itself. So in version 1.4, what is new? Um, today, I'm going to cover um, quite a few new uh, workflows um, or uh, improved tools or workflows. Um, one is a new workflow for using ContentDM with Archivematica. Um, ContentDM was one of the first access systems that Archivematica um, integrated with, and that's been sponsored all the way along by UBC Library. After a number of years of uh, testing and production work at UBC, um, we've come up with what we think is a more streamlined solution for using ContentDM with Archivematica, and I'll describe that process. There's also a new way to download or review your dissemination information package directly from dashboard. So I'll show you how that works. We've had an exciting new um, sponsored project to index the BAG info metadata um, if you are ingesting BAGs into the system. If you're um, receiving um, files uh, packaged in the Library of Congress Bagit format, um, then there's a new way that, that Archivematica will index the metadata that comes with the bag so that you can search for it later. I'll explain in more detail uh, when we do the demonstration. We've added um, Siegfried as a tool for file identification, and I'll talk a little bit about why you might want to experiment with that. We've added a way to clean up your processing area through the dashboard. 
And there's also um, sponsored by the Museum of Modern Art by MoMA. There's a, a process now for ape recovery. If you have a backed up ape um, in another storage area that you'd like to replace um, in your main storage area, you can. there's a process to do that now. And these last three points in italics on the slide, I'm not going to go through those today, um, but just to let you know that these features now do exist in, in Archivematica 1.4. Um, with the help of UBC Library, we've improved the uh, METS file that comes from a DSpace export. Um, there's now a more clear relationship between the digital objects and the community or collection that they've come from in your DSpace repository. So we're very happy about that um, improvement. Um, there's been a, a little bit of buzz about uh, our integration with Islandora, which um, has been sponsored by University of Saskatchewan Libraries. Um, the Islandora integration uses a third-party plugin called Archidora, which was developed by Discovery Garden. And um, that uh, topic could be its own webinar and screencast by itself. So if that's a, um, a workflow that interests you, that you'd like to hear more about, please do get in touch and give us that feedback so that we can land uh, something for the future. And uh, finally, you can now extract packages recursively in Archivematica. And by that, I mean if you have a zipped package inside a zipped package, Archivematica is able to extract all of the layers of packages and will also create a log file reflecting um, which zipped packages existed to begin with so that you have that logged. So those last three points we won't cover in any further detail today, but you're always welcome, of course, to post questions to our user forum or check out our documentation. So now I'm going to flip over to a demonstration. So you are now looking at an Archivematica dashboard. Um, there aren't any major um, uh, changes in the user interface in version 1.4. So for Archivematica users, this will look very familiar. I'll give just a brief introduction to um, how Archivematica processing usually works, uh, just for those who might be new users or who haven't used Archivematica in a while. Generally, Archivematica works in sort of a left to right process. You usually start by transferring in material in the transfer tab before moving it into ingest. And an ingest is the place where Archivematica will create an AIP, an archival information package, and if you uh, choose to do so, a DIP, a dissemination information package for your access system. Once that work is done, it's processed and kept, um, uh, a record is kept in the archival storage tab. So all of the apes that you've created in your Archivematic installation uh, can be viewed through the archival storage tab. Preservation planning tab is where you can view and update rules about um, the different preservation actions taken in Archivematica, such as normalization. Access provides links to, out to Atom. Um, currently, there aren't any, uh, well, you know, this uh, particular installation of Archivematica actually hasn't sent any dips to Atom, but um, that we currently don't have any other integration with the Access tab, but we would love to see that in the future. And finally, the Administration tab is where administrators can um, set configurations and um, other sort of administrative tasks within Archivematica. So if you're familiar with OAIS, all of these terms would have sounded very familiar to you. Um, we purposefully use the terminology from OAIS um, to sort of reinforce its um, compliance with those workflows. So where I'm going to start today is in the ingest tab. And I'm going to start describing our new uh, workflow for use with Content DM. And what I have here um, is I have a package which I started in transfer, and I'm at the normalization step. So this is the, the step at which you basically tell Archivematica, do you want to create an ape and a dip, or just an ape, and do you want to use some kind of specialized workflow? The most straightforward workflow to describe is to normalize for preservation and access. 
And what that means is that Archivematica will take the digital objects and create preservation friendly um, versions as well as storing the original files in the AIP. And it will take the original files and also make a copy in a access friendly format um, to use for the DIP. So this particular transfer um, is from our sample uh, data. So if you've uh, downloaded and installed Archivematica just for experimenting with, then maybe you've been using our sample data. And this particular uh, transfer is our CSV transfer. And I'm going to open another tab here. This is from um, um, GitHub. Uh, and GitHub is where we store the Archivematica sample data. So you can go in and download it from there. You can clone this repository of, of data. Um, you can also just view uh, the files. So what I have open here is I have um, the metadata.csv file open that is showing um, what is the metadata that's included in that sample transfer that I was um, that I have in ingest right now. So this is the metadata that is included um, with these digital objects. So each digital object in the package has a line in the CSV metadata, and we've used uh, Dublin Core headers to describe the title, the date, uh, the description, and its provenance. The reason why this is important is because um, when I get to the process where we're preparing a DIP for content CSM, this metadata is to be used to create a tab delimited file that uh, will work for content DM. So going back to the Archivematica dashboard, I think it's normalized for preservation and access. So Archivematica will be creating an ape and a dip, and when it's finished, it's going to give us a report that we can review to uh, approve that normalization to make sure we're happy with the results. Here we go. So we can click on this little report icon. It opens up in a new tab. And if there had been any failures, they'd be highlighted in red just for kind of easy um, understanding. But uh, we can see here that we imported a, a TGA file and a JPEG, and they were both successfully normalized for preservation and for access. So I'm happy with those results. I'm going to choose Approve. And now Archivematica is going to do its final steps to create the AIP and the DIP. When it comes time to do something with the DIP, I'll take this time to explain um, how this is going to work with Content DM. In previous versions, oh, I just also have to choose um, uh, a file identification method for uh, submission documentation. So I just chose FIDO there, but we have a number of others you could choose from. Um, in previous versions of Archivematica, the workflow with Content DM worked in one of two ways. One was that Archivematica would uh, create the dissemination information package um, that ContentDM could use, including a tab delimited file. And uh, ContentDM users will know that this tab delimited file is how you upload uh, metadata with your digital objects. If you already have existing metadata and you don't want to enter it into the ContentDM um, interface, then you can do so in what's called project client, which is part of the content DM bundle. So that option has always been available. Um, but what Archivematica attempted to do was it attempted to verify whether or not your CSV file was a match for the content DM collection. So it was talking to the content DM server, passing information back and forth. We also had a uh, workflow where you could directly upload a DIP from Archivematica to ContentDM, bypassing the project client altogether. However, we found that this workflow is very problematic. It had a lot of bugs in it. And um, ultimately, uh, many ContentDM users really prefer to use the project client because it has all kinds of great features for using ContentDM anyway. It does OCR and, and all kinds of other um, things that uh, that users really prefer to use. So now the new process is far more streamlined and I'll show it to you now. So this Archivematica installation, it's not uh, trying to communicate with any installation of content DM. It doesn't know what your collections look like. It doesn't know um, what fields are in your collection. It's relying on you to create that metadata.csv file that we looked at earlier 
um, to use all of the appropriate fields for your uh, particular digital collection. So when I go to upload dip, if I choose upload dip to content DM, it's going to uh, prepare a package of material, which we can then review in the dashboard. So uh, you can see that completed rather quickly. There's only two files in the sample transfer, so I wouldn't expect it to take very long. And if you click on review, it brings you in a new tab to the uploaded dips directory of Archivematica. You can find your dip there. I had called it CDM dip for content DM. And inside the objects folder, we have the two access objects. We also have a tab delimited file, in this case called simple.txt. I can open it in my browser because it's just a text file. And I realize that that's probably a little hard to see. I'm gonna make it a little bigger for you. So here you can see um, in the first row, you can see the various um, uh, field names that have been used. So the title, the date, the description, the provenance, the identifier, those have all been taken from the metadata.csv file. In fact, where they've actually taken from is the Archivematica METS file. So the CSV file is in, um, it translated into description um, metadata within the METS file, and Archivematica uses the METS file to create this file. It adds the UUID or the unique uh, universal identifier of the AIP as well as of the preservation file so that you can reference back from your access system from ContentDM to the AIP. It finishes with the file name. Uh, you'll notice that um, the Archivematica Attica CSV starts with file name, but the content DM tab file ends with the file name because that's how content DM requires it to be um, to be stored. So um, if we had used instead of um, a, a simple CSV file where there's one line for every um, every digital object, we could have instead made a complex tab file by including metadata for directories of objects as well. So for example, say you had a collection of photo albums and you had metadata of the album itself and you also had metadata about each photograph within. You could do that now in Archivematica. It can understand a CSV file that includes both directories and individual files. The screen is still big. Make that normal size again. So um, that's the content DM process. Um, but uh, there's sort of a happy side effect if you're not using content DM to this process. So I have another dip example here ready to normalize. I'm again going to choose normalize for preservation and access. And we'll see the other um, dip options uh, and we'll talk about them this time after it does normalization. This is a slightly bigger sample file, so it might take a little longer to, um, to normalize. One thing that I'll note that I did in that last demonstration, I didn't follow my own bestness, which is to always store your ape before doing anything with your dip. So if I had been doing this um, in the real world for uh, production, I would have stored that ape first, just to make sure that the preservation copies are stored before you have access copies that reference back to those preservation copies. So I'm just gonna go ahead and approve this normalization without checking it just to uh, move the demonstration along. And just a reminder, what's happening at this point is um, Archivematica is creating a dip as well as an ape. In this case, um, the sample um, the sample transfer that I used, it didn't have a metadata.csv file. So it's not going to have any information from which to, um, to grab uh, to create that tab file for content DM. So we're not going to use the content DM process for this particular example. We'll use a different uh, dip option. Here we go, so it's still preparing the ape, but it's ready with the dip. So you'll notice that the other options aside from content DM, uh, currently our archivist toolkit, um, Adam, uh, you can reject the dip, 
or you can store it. And what I'm going to do just for demonstration purposes is store the dip. So what it's doing is it is putting the dip in a location that we've configured in the Archivematica storage service. You can possibly have multiple locations for storing your dips if you wish. And now that it's stored, again, you can see we have this review link. So I'm going to click that. Again, I get to the uploaded dips directory of Archivematica. Your other dip is still there. The content DM one we were still working with, it's still there. It'll be there until it's cleared out. And uh, here's the dip example that, um, that we just processed. And here are the objects as well as um, the METS file is also available. So this is um, just another way that you can access your DIPs. So um, for both of these examples, they're relatively small DIPs. They don't have a lot of files. But of course, you could have a DIP that has, you know, like uh, dozens or hundreds even of objects. So the likelihood of wanting to download each one from here is uh, very unlikely. So what um, what we expect probably a lot of users will do is use an SFTP client, something like FileZilla, to access your Archivematica server to access this directory and to um, um, transfer the objects directory to somewhere useful to you. So your reasons for storing a dip, they could vary. It might be because you're not sure when you'll be able to provide access, but you wanted to create the access copies, or maybe you have an access system that Archivematica doesn't currently integrate with, and you need to just be able to download those access objects and manually upload them to another system. Um, so this is just another way that you can get at those objects if you'd like. So what I'm going to do now is because um, it's just a good segue from looking at those uploaded uh, dips, I'm going to go to the administration tab and show you a new administration feature we have, which is processing storage usage. And um, after I click on it, you can see that there's a number of places where Archivematica is keeping files that it doesn't necessarily need to keep the long term. So one is dip uploads, which we were just looking at. And we can see here that on this particular server, uh, dip uploads is taking up 5.3 megabytes out of uh, in a, a total available almost 20 gigabytes. So it's, it's not really a big deal right now, but eventually that's going to fill up. And maybe you'd like to clear that out so that um, you keep your processing uh, pipeline running smoothly and it will run faster. And uh, this way you can do these uh, clear outs of these unnecessary objects uh, without having to go through the command line or have any access to the server. There's also, um, you can also clear out the rejected files. So if you reject a SIP or a DIP or an APE, um, it sits in a rejected directory until it gets cleared out. If an APE uh, or a SIP fails, uh, there's a failed directory. And there's also just a temporary directory where um, is sometimes um, sit temporarily. So none of these, um, Depending on your workflows, you, you don't necessarily need to keep these files in rejected or failed or temporary. For DIP uploads, um, you might want to have an internal process at your institution where um, you um, have a, a, a process for checking, have we uh, you know, fully processed that DIP? Has it been uploaded to our access system? Was it successful? maybe only after the, the you say yes, then you clear out your dip uploads. So I'm going to click clear. It's going to ask me if I'm sure. And I'll say delete. And now you can see, see that it's cleared out the uploaded dips. So this is a um, like this is a hard deletion. It's not moving it to another directory. It's wiping it out. So you want to be really sure that you're finished with those dips before you delete them. But I just want wanted to um, highlight this new availability and it's particularly useful if your Archivematica instance is hosted by somebody else. So for example, if you're a client of Archives Direct, which is our partnership with JuraCloud, um, there's a way that you can keep your processing pipeline clear since you won't have direct access to your Archivematica server. So I'm just going to close a couple of tabs that we don't need anymore. And the next I'm going to demonstrate is um, the new ability to index BEG um, info metadata. And uh, just as a reminder, 
Um, if you're if you've never used um, Archivematica's ability to ingest bags before, you can choose an unzipped bag or a zipped bag, and um, as long as it's in uh, compliant with the Library of Congress bag format, then um, it can be processed and stored in Archivematica. So I've already processed um, a bag, which is our sample bag from our sample data. If I go to archival storage, which is where we are now, you can see it's here at the top. It's the bag example. But suppose we had you know, hundreds of apes in here and we needed to find this particular bag example. Um, this is a, a new way that you can search for it. So again, I'm going to just uh, flow over to GitHub to our Archivematica sample data. And I'm here because I want to show you the contents of the bag info.txt. So uh, the bag info.txt file is where you can store all kinds of information about the bag, about the contents of the bag. Um, the door is really wide open for what kind of metadata you want to store here. In our sample data, we don't have anything too crazy. We just have the bagging date and the bag size. Um, but the client who sponsored this feature, they had a need for all kinds of metadata in this bag info file that they were um, receiving from other departments within their institution. So um, you can include really any field that you have, whatever you want to call it. So you could call it collection dash name or um, institution dash department to describe the department of your institution that the files came from. Um, you can have your own internal kind of specification for what you want to include. The only sort of restriction that I'll mention on what these field names look like um, is what's going to happen is Archivematica is going to take this metadata and it's going to put it in what's called the source MD part of the METS file. So um, your field names have to be XML compliant because it's going to be turned into an XML tag. So you wouldn't want to have a space in your field name or you wouldn't want to have any restricted characters in your field name. But that's why um, um, like a word dash another word is a good format to use um, to describe these fields. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to search specifically for this information, uh, the, the size of the bag, which I happen to know because I'm looking at the bag info text is uh, 34.5 kilobytes. So um, in the archival storage tab, you can choose a number of different ways to search. And the two new ones are transfer metadata and transfer metadata other. So transfer metadata will search anything in the source MD part of the METS file. Currently, the only thing that's going to go into that part of the METS file is things from the bag info um, file when you ingest bags. Um, however, uh, it leaves the door open for kind of future work, um, maybe with other systems in the future where other types of metadata could possibly go into the source MD. So if I search for the content that I know is there, in transfer metadata, we find the example bag. We could also, if we had a lot of fields and we wanted to specify that it came from this field, bag size, just like it's described here in the bag info file, we can do the same search. And of course, it finds the same sample. So you can imagine how useful this could be if you had many different fields in this bag info.txt file. It really opens up a lot of possibilities for searching through storage. Um, you can search by keyword. You can also do a date range search um, if you have date information in your bag info. Um, and there's specific syntax that you need to use for date range searches, which you can find um, in the Archivematica documentation. We've updated all the documentation relevant to the new features, and you'll find it um, on the Archivematica website. So I'm going to go back to the transfer tab, and I'm going to start a new transfer so that I can demonstrate uh, the new uh, file identification um, tool that we've integrated, which is Siegfried. So I'm just going to start an, another transfer called example. I'm going to browse for content. And from our sample transfers, this time I'm going to choose our multimedia files. 
which is here under multimedia, I click add and start transfer. It'll pop up in a second with the um, request to approve it. We'll approve the transfer. And once it gets to file identification, I'll show you um, that you can now select Siegfried as your tool. So Siegfried um, is a little like Fido in the sense that they both use Pronom, um, which is a, a huge database of formats managed by the National Archives of the UK. Um, However, it uh, checks uh, slightly different things than FIDO does. So depending on your workflows, on your particular use cases, what kind of files you're processing, you might find it beneficial to use Siegfried instead of FIDO. Um, Siegfried is very new. It's in version one. So right now we're sort of encouraging people to use it in Archivematica, to test with it, to see what your results like. So I'm going to run Siegfried. You can see it here. Um, Fido, of course, is still supported um, as is file extension. Here we'll run Siegfried. And um, what might be interesting is to run the same transfers side by side using Fido and using Siegfried. So here um, in identify file format, you can see I've had a failure. It's highlighted in pink. And if I click on the cog, it'll give us the output for, um, for the tool. So I purposefully chose a sample transfer that would show a failure. And um, the reason why I did that is not to, to, to say that like Siegfried didn't do as good a job as Fido did. But in fact, what we discovered when we were doing um, some of our early um, early testing with Siegfried was that it's actually um, it's gathering more information so it's um, or, or different it's gathering different kinds of information I guess would be the way to put it and um, therefore giving different results for identifying in files so in this case um, this was a, a, is a video file that doesn't have um, an audio track and it um, part of the reason why it's um, had a hard time identifying it is for that reason. So um, this is like pretty, um, for some folks, sort of advanced work. So to really kind of get to know your file formats and to get to know what does a, a failure in Archivematica mean? It doesn't mean that the tool failed necessarily. It means that there's something about that particular file that might be uh, unique and that might be valuable information for you to have. So I just want to really encourage the community to try out Breed Tool and um, to post your results maybe to our user forum um, and uh, you know we'd love to hear about how you're using it. So finally the last um, I will show you um, a little bit about is the ape recovery process and we won't actually go through the process of recovering an ape but I'm going to explain what the process would be like. So first, I'm going to open up the um, storage service for this particular installation of Archivematica. And just as a reminder, um, you uh, know, in a normal installation of Archivematica, you find the storage service on port 8000. And for uh, new users to Archivematica or those who aren't um, as familiar, the storage service is where you set up transfer locations, ape storage locations, dip storage locations. It's where you connect whatever your storage system is to Archivematica. So in the scenario um, that we're imagining for ape recovery, um, we're imagining that um, there's maybe been uh, a server failure or something, but you have backups of your ape and you'd like to take that backed up copy and make it a replacement for the copy that Archivematica is currently um, storing or pointing to in your storage system. So uh, what would happen is you would take your, uh, your recovered ape, the one that you want to be the replacement ape, and you would put it in a specific location if you go to the locations tab in the storage service, you'll see there's a new um, location type, which is ape recovery. So here is just a, um, a default path to the recovery area. And um, you could set up other locations for your ape recovery if you wish. Uh, but this would be the default. And you would take the package that you want to be the replacement and you would put it here. 
you would then need to alert Archivematica to the existence of that new package. So at MoMA, the, who was the spring institution of this feature, they're using Binder. So there's a way in Binder to um, alert Archivematica to this particular, um, to the fact that there's a, a, an ape that needs to be recovered. If uh, you're not using Binder, then um, you would need to write a curl command or um, you know, there's possibilities for integrations with other storage or management systems um, to be able to, to write a command to um, tell Archivematica, hey, there's an ape that needs to be recovered. So once that process has taken place, place you'd go to packages, you'd view recovery, and um, you can see that there's been a couple of tests done on this particular server. Um, if there were new requests um, pending, then they would be here, and you would click through to approve um, the recovery. And then Archivematica would um, replace the ape that used to be stored in through the storage service with the new uh, recovered ape. Um, so that is, is how that feature works. So that's um, all of the features that I wanted to show you today. Um, we'd really like to encourage um, you all to um, give Archivematica 1.4 a try. And in fact, in the meantime, we've actually released a bug fix release. So if you install Archivematica from packages now um, using the 1.4 package, you'll actually get 1.4.1, which had a couple of uh, bug fixes in it. So it's quite up to date, and uh, we hope that you give it a try. Thank you so much, and uh, hope to see you on the user forums.